Sophia's fourth letter. Dear Yaristan, so much has happened since I sent you my last letter, and most of it has confirmed your statement that you and I live in completely different worlds. I have no idea what place you would occupy in my world, and you can't know what place I'd occupy in yours. It certainly wouldn't be the same place you assign me. I admit I was shocked by what Yasna told about the people I've regarded as my comrades. I was particularly shocked by the ruthlessness and inhumanity with which Mark and Vera attain their bureaucratic goals. But I don't have even a shred of sympathy for the path they took. Nothing in me could have accepted or even drifted in the direction in which they moved. Your characterization of me fails. I didn't identify with Mark, Vera, or Adrian, and I obviously didn't identify with Claude. If I identified with anyone in Yasna's or your narrative, it was with Yasna herself, and much as you hate my saying it, with you. I identified with you, Yaristan, not because my life was anything like yours, but because I wish it had been, particularly right now. I am generally overjoyed that you're finding in your present life everything I sought but never found throughout my life, a real and significant project with people who are alive and want to be. I came close to that kind of activity only once, and you've just about convinced me that I wasn't close to it even then. Since then, I've come no closer than a caricature comes to an original event. My experiences during the past two weeks have been such caricatures of the experiences I've longed for. Two weeks ago, there was a demonstration at the university where Damon Hesper teaches. Damon was my friend during my student days. We were on the university newspaper staff together. He's the person who helped me find my present teaching job. At the demonstration, about a hundred students barricaded themselves into the university administration building and announced they wouldn't leave until the university accepted a long list of demands. The university president announced that if the students didn't leave the building immediately, he would call the police to evict them by force. In response to this announcement, several hundred students and teaching assistants planted themselves in front of the administration building to act as a kind of buffer between police and the occupying students. Only one professor was among those in front of the building, Damon Hesper. That evening, the police attacked. According to Damon, it was more like an invading army. The police, who far outnumbered the people inside as well as outside the building, simply pushed their way into the building. They arrested all the students inside as well as most of the people outside, including Damon, whom they beat. Damon called me that night and told me to be ready with bail money in the morning. I went to jail the following morning, but he was already out. Everyone had been released. Damon had an ugly cut across his face. We came to my house by taxi, and I called the doctor. Damon is really the only good friend I have now, except for my two housemates. He's the only one of the people with whom I worked on the newspaper staff whom I still see. Sabina has an intense dislike for him, and Tina doesn't think a whole lot of him either. My own respect for him went down considerably during the past two weeks, and your letter had a lot to do with this. I think that without the observations you made, I wouldn't have been so critical of the role Damon played in the events that followed the demonstration. A week ago, Damon came to the house to tell me several students were going to call for a strike to protest against the police repression of the students who had occupied the building. He brought me several copies of a leaflet they had prepared announcing a student general strike. I thought it was a good leaflet. It didn't only attack the repression of the student demonstrators, but also raised questions about the university's involvement in weapons development and war strategy, questions about the ugly relationship between the university and the working class community that surrounds it, and questions about the education itself about its authoritarian form and its apologetic content. Although I'm no longer connected to the university, I decided to take part in the strike. I became very excited thinking I would be involved in activity that, that in some way re resembled the strike you described in your previous letter. I was intensely disappointed. The event resembled a strike only in name. The day after Damon's visit, I went to my job at the community college. Since the leaflet wasn't addressed only to students of the university, but to all students and was a call for a general strike, I read it to my class. I also announced that I wasn't a strike breaker and wouldn't come to class on the day of the strike. This was probably the longest lecture I had given in my class. Not a single one of the students expressed the slightest sympathy for the leaflet, for the coming strike, or for me. Most of them were completely indifferent, and some were actually hostile. One person criticized the students who had occupied the administration building because they had illegally trespassed on private property. What was more upsetting to me was that I was the only one who laughed when he said this. I should remind you that the people in my class are workers. They haven't yet reached the managerial post to which they aspire. They still work in factories. Since they trespass on private property, the person continued, the police were only doing their job when they arrested them. Another student argued that strikes were for higher wages and improved working conditions, and that therefore the leaflet was not calling for a strike but for a riot. I argued that it was up to strikers to define what they were striking for, but this statement provoked protest from almost all the workers in the room workers who had all participated in strikes. 
If everyone defined his own strike, it would be anarchy, one student complained. The dominant view was that the unions and the government define the aims of a strike. There seems to be a great deal of similarity between a situation where strikes are illegal and a situation where strikes are institutionalized. Here, strikes are nominally legal, but only those strikes which are called by the unions and sanctioned by the law are legal. In practice, this means that any genuine strike, any strike organized by the workers themselves with aims which they themselves define, is as illegal as it was in your environment for the past 20 years and is just as savagely repressed. Even the fact that I talked about a strike in my class led to my being intimidated. Or rather, it wasn't just the fact that I talked about it, but the fact that I acted on it, took part in it, called off my class that led to intimidation. Just talking is all right. My last class before the general strike was dull. No one even mentioned the coming event. Everyone seemed to know that something was going to happen. Later on, I learned that several of the students in my class were also in a psychology class and that they had talked about me in their class. When my class ended, some of the students left, but others stood in the hall and were joined by a professor I'd seen before. He teaches behavioral psychology and is on some administrative body of the college. The professor shouted at me as I came out of the classroom, I understand you decided to revise the length of the school term. You understand correctly, I told him. I'm not a scab, and I won't come to work during a strike. Such matters are taken up by the proper authorities, Miss Natchelow, he said. No, they're not, I said. Since when did the bosses determine when a strike was to take place? You encourage violence against what you call the bosses, don't you, Miss Nachello? he asked. What does that have to do with it, I shouted. I'm taking part in a strike and you're not going to stop me. That's just the point, Miss Nachello, he said, and he grinned. Nothing at all is going to stop you. You're a dangerous person. You shouldn't be teaching in a college. You should be undergoing treatment in a hospital. His statement, his smugness, and his idiotic grin infuriated me. Such people and their cousins in the police are called pigs by a small number of radical students. I certainly sympathize with this attempt to call certain people by their proper names. Why, you bastard, I shouted. I'll show you just how dangerous I am. I slapped his face twice with all my might. He didn't raise his hands to protect himself. Instead, he grinned even more stupidly, like a genuine masochist. He said, everyone can see you're an extremely violent person, Miss Nachello. One student yelled, bravo, champ. The rest dispersed like zombies. I walked away trembling with anger and frustration. After that event as a build-up, the actual strike that took place was a real letdown. Your letter arrived one day before the general strike. I was so excited by certain passages that I translated and typed them up. I wanted to show Damon that experiences similar to ours were taking place on the other side of the world. What struck me most was your description of your situation in the carton plant. I then imagined my own situation was about to become similar to yours. I thought I was about to experience a progression of events similar to the one you described. Last week there had been an unprecedented demonstration. Today a general strike of students was breaking up. Next week workers might go on strike, and if the ferment continues, then a new life might be possible here too, as you put it, a human life inhibited by no barriers external to the developing individuals. But I was only dreaming, so please don't take this as another of my misguided attempts to identify my situation with yours. On the morning of the strike... I waited impatiently for Damon to come by for me. He normally didn't start teaching until noon and consequently wasn't in the habit of starting out early. When he finally picked me up at lunchtime, I left the house without the pages I had typed up for him, but you'll see that those pages, in fact your entire letter, strongly affected my perception of the day's events and particularly of Damon. My disappointment with Damon began the moment he arrived. I was peeved because of how late he had come and how nonchalant he had acted about the whole thing. He seemed to be going to the university the same way he would have gone any other day at the same hour, apparently with the same thoughts. He seemed completely indifferent about the strike and didn't talk about it. I realized that I had magnified the importance of what was going to happen because of what had already happened to me. I even asked him, aren't you excited? No, he said, why should I be excited? I don't know, I said, what if the police attack again? What makes you think they're going to attack again? He asked, snickering at me. I really do have a vivid imagination when I think about strikes and demonstrations. That's one critical observation of yours that really hits its mark. I suppose I got that from Louisa. Every time a group of people get together to protest, I see the revolution around the corner. The expectations I had built up in myself for that strike certainly had no relation to what actually happened. It was a beautiful spring day, the first really warm day of the year. The strike, it turned out, was one vast picnic which seemed to extend over the lawns of the university campus. I'm not saying this with irony. I was actually somewhat pleased. Nothing of this sort had ever happened at the university when I had been a student. The picnic seemed enjoyable enough. Students had come with their lunches and thermos bottles. 
I even saw groups of students with large coolers, with boxes full of picnic supplies, and some even had brought lawn chairs and folding tables. It was a nice picnic, but it wasn't the event I anticipated from the leaflet that announced a general strike, and it certainly wasn't the violent riot anticipated by the domesticated students who attended my class. The event wasn't particularly festive. There was no singing or dancing or theater. There were just groups of friends picnicking on the grass. The event didn't indicate the end of the university or the beginning of anything new. Everyone knew that classes would resume normally the following day. I suppose that would have bothered me less if your letter hadn't arrived that very day. I looked for signs of something new, but there wasn't a trace of the ferment your letters have described. As a general strike, this event was a bad joke. Only one minor detail reminded me that the event was not merely a picnic. A young woman ran up to Damon and announced very proudly, You know what, Professor Hesper? A group of us ran through the administration building yelling, Jailbreak! Damon smiled and said, That's great. Was anyone there? Losing most of her enthusiasm, she answered, The secretaries and deans. Several students sitting on the steps of the administration building caught sight of Damon and began waving and shouting for him to join them. Come on, Damon told me. I'll introduce you to the political students. Normally I would have said that I'd be delighted to meet the political students. Normally, I would have preferred the company of political students to that of apolitical students. I don't mean normally. I mean before your last two letters came. Because of your letters, I began to hear words I had never really heard before, and I began to see a Damon I had never really looked at before. When we came up to the group, Damon introduced me. Sophie Natchelo, meet the organizers of this unusual event. One of the organizers said, I know who you are. You're the faculty radical who was fired a year ago right after the riot. I recognize you too, I told him. I recognized two or three of the others as well. A couple of years ago, right after I had gotten my first teaching job, I attended a large protest meeting which was destroyed by manipulative politicians who had elected themselves the leaders of the student movement. I think I told you about that meeting. Three or four of those very politicians were among the political students to whom Damon introduced me. What happened next on the steps of the administration building was so bizarre that I'll try to describe it in detail. First of all, because I'd like to engrave that event on my memory, and secondly, because I'd like to show you that I do read your letters attentively. Your letter is what made this event clear to me. It was the day of the great strike against the university. The leaflet announcing the strike had specifically described the authoritarian character of the education as one of the targets against which the strike was launched. Yet Damon placed himself on the bottom step and began lecturing like an orator in a coliseum, the omniscient professor lecturing to his ignorant admirers. What took place on the steps of the administration building was the most authoritarian classroom situation I have ever experienced, and those subjected to it were the students who had been introduced to me as the organizers of the strike against that type of authoritarianism. Damon always introduced himself to people as basically a worker. He had worked in a factory for several years before he was employed in the university. In this context, among those he called the political students, the fact that he considered himself basically a worker made him their idol. The lecture began when, after introducing all the students to me by name, Damon said, This was easy, but this isn't what counts. By this he meant the student strike. A young woman I didn't recognize objected to this put-down of the student strike. I think this does count. Many of the students come from working-class homes, and most of them are going to be workers of one type or another. At that point, Damon began a tirade. At one or another time, I had agreed with most of what he said, and I still do agree with much of it. But he spoke in a tone that was terribly intimidating and in a context which totally falsified what he said. I remember what you had written about the mirrors created by politicians, mirrors which reflect people's desires and transform them into images, words. Damon turned to the young woman and said, That theory of students and professors being part of the so-called new working class is so much baloney invented by petty bourgeois academic sociologists. He spoke calmly, but what he said was so intimidating to the young woman, to the rest of the group, and even to me, that he might as well have shouted at the top of his voice. It's probably true that the theory of the new working class is baloney, invented by academic sociologists, but Damon's statement had nothing to do with what the young woman had said. He intimidated her by identifying her comment with a theory she was probably unfamiliar with. He transformed what she had said into an expression of sympathy for a petty bourgeois theory. He then continued to push his point in the same direction. The only test of class is someone's relation to production. People whose function is to manipulate others, like professors, are best defined as middle class. I felt like shouting and telling the political students that they were being taken by a hoax, precisely the type of hoax you described. I again agreed with his words, but how were his listeners and he related to those words? He was talking to students, some of whom were already experienced manipulators. 
He was himself a professor, yet he spoke as if his and their lives and functions were totally unrelated to what he said, as if he were talking about other professors, other manipulators, other members of the middle class. The best paid and most thoroughly unionized workers in the basic and heavy industries are crucial to revolutionary potential and cannot be brushed aside and replaced by clerical workers, students, professors, and so on, he continued. The fact that workers are at the point of production is the source of the revolutionary capacity of the working class. Their work teaches them how to run production. Up to this point, I thought I agreed with every statement Damon had made, but the very fact that I agree with his words made me realize that such agreement has nothing to do with shared commitments and projects. I agreed with the statements, but the context of those statements made me want to shout my disagreement. I grew increasingly frustrated as Damon's lecture progressed further. I stopped agreeing with the statements he made, although I wasn't able to articulate my disagreements until later that evening, when Tina tore into Damon's arguments. He must have talked without a break for at least an hour. The main point of this lecture was that capitalism, by concentrating workers in the basic industries, had itself created the organization and discipline of the new society. I had heard that whole argument innumerable times before, and I used to agree with it. I started to doubt its validity before I started corresponding with you, but thanks to your letters and especially your brief descriptions of Jan Sedlock's insights, I'm finally able to express my understanding of what's wrong with that argument. Damon glorifies the absolute degradation of the human individual and the human community for which capitalism is responsible. He locates the new society in the assembly lines, the furnaces, and the mines, his argument is an apology for the unprecedentedly inhuman hell created by capitalism. I was so irritated by what Damon said that it didn't dawn on me until later that I had heard every single one of his statements before in exactly the same words. He had already said the same things 14 years earlier. The context was apparently irrelevant. It was nothing but an occasion for repeating the same performance. The statements he made on the steps of the administration building were the political beliefs of the organization to which he had belonged when I had met him on the newspaper staff. Despite all that's happened during the past 14 years, Damon has somehow managed not to change a single one of his ideas. I can now understand why you were so shocked when you read my first letter and recognized a person and an outlook you had known 20 years ago. I hope I haven't been as rigid as Damon. That's frightening. He could have put all his views on a photograph record 14 years ago, and anyone who wanted to meet him could simply play the record. That's eerie. Damon isn't altogether a living person. There were no questions when Damon finished his lecture. He simply said, well, see you next week. This was incomprehensible to me. The students got up and joined picnickers on the lawn. I asked Damon, what do you mean you'll see them next week? Are they going to call for another general strike just so they can listen to you deliver the same lecture another time? I was furious at Damon. I was also furious at myself for having made such a scene at the community college for the sake of this travesty of a strike, and especially for the delusions with which I had filled myself while anticipating this great day. He either disregarded my anger and frustration, or else he didn't notice it. Very matter-of-factly, as if everything was exactly as it should be, he told me, I'll see them next week, because we get together one night a week. Since there was no school today, we had decided to meet during the day. Indignantly, I asked, You mean this was a class? and you carried it on precisely with the group who had organized the strike against classes? Still matter-of-factly, as if we were unable to grasp the contradiction, he said, this isn't a formal university class. It's an altogether informal affair, and it was convenient to all concerned to me today. You hypocrite, I shouted. You call people to a strike, and you're the one who breaks it? That was the most formal university class I've ever attended. Informal my ass. It's infinitely more formal than mine, and I walked out of my teaching job because there was a strike. He looked at me with genuine surprise and asked, Did I ask you to do that? Of course he hadn't asked me to walk out of my job, nor had he told me that the strike would be the first stage of a revolution. He had merely given me a leaflet, and I had asked him to drive me to campus on the day of the strike. I had neglected to ask if the leaflet meant what it said. I asked Damon to take me home. On the way to his car, I asked about the class he was going to give to those he called the political students. He told me that some of the students I had just met were in the process of forging a relevant type of organization. I could guess which ones. He went on to say there had already been talk about publishing a newspaper. Another student paper, I asked. No, not a student newspaper, he said. He was peeved. I've had my fill of student newspapers, haven't you? What I'm talking about is an organization that organizes itself to publish a worker's paper. But you've just convinced me that you and those other members of your organization are anything but workers, I said. What do you mean by a worker's paper? You've just spent an hour describing the paper's publishers as middle-class manipulators. With an appearance of genuine surprise, he asked, what's that got to do with it? 
The naivete with which he asked this made me suppose that I had missed something which would have been perfectly obvious to anyone else. I recognized the source of his ability to intimidate. Echoing your argument, probably word for word, I said that such a paper published by Damon and his group of political students could only transform the real activity of workers into the political program of Damon's organization, once again representing and replacing workers like all the other politicians who speak in their name. Damon finally lost his matter-of-factness. He spoke to me in a tone he's rarely used on me before, a paternalistic, condescending tone. I didn't say we were going to write the paper. The workers themselves are going to write it. I'm not talking about a newspaper for workers. You're the one who is talking about that. I'm talking about a workers' newspaper. Its task will not be to speak for the workers, but to let the workers themselves speak. There's no question here of representing workers or replacing them or any of that old crap. I said earlier that the new society is created at the point of production, particularly in the basic industries. It's not created in the heads of intellectuals. The sole task of this paper will be to recognize the existence of the new society and to record the facts of its existence. This statement mystified me completely. The words described a project I would have embraced without reservation under other circumstances. Yet under the present circumstances, everything about it seemed false. The selflessness that such a project would require was to be carried precisely by people who were among the crassest politicians I've ever seen. That paper would recognize not the new society, but merely Damon's ideology, and it would record not the facts of the struggle for the creation of the new society, but the rising influence of Damon's organization among workers. But it sounded like something altogether different. It became clear to me why Damon had remained consistent for so many years. He had answers to everything, detailed and documented answers, which he had worked out and perfected years ago, and the more he repeated them, the more perfect they became. He carried a corpse in his mouth. On that day, I recognized Damon as the pedagogue who deserves all the critiques you formulated. How grateful I am for your letter. I really don't think I could have seen through him on my own. How perfectly he fits your description. He and his students are going to edit a worker's paper, not a paper for workers. Damon agrees with your critique of representation. He agrees so much that he'll represent the end of representation. He knows who the real revolutionaries are, and therefore his paper will really be revolutionary. He knows that professors and students are middle class, and therefore his paper will not be a student's or a professor's paper. He knows that the new society is located at the point of production, and therefore his paper will not be merely another political gimmick, nor his organization another racket. He'll reflect the new society. On the way to my house, I tell Damon about my correspondence with you, and I beg him to come in and read the excerpts from your letter. When we go in... Sabina and Tina are sitting in the living room discussing your letter. Damon takes the translated sections and goes to my bedroom to read them. I tell Sabina and Tina that I'm going to call Louisa. Tina asks if I really think Louisa will be willing to experience another scene like the one we had last time we discussed your letter. I call Louisa and tell her your letter contains a long account of Vyazna Zurukova's life. Louisa says she'd like to borrow the letter and read it by herself at her house. I guess she was really upset by our all-night session. Tina's first comment about your letter is, Wow, what a put-down of all your friends, Sophia. Tina, predictably, is enchanted by the put-down. Tina goes to the kitchen. It's her turn to make supper. When I go to the kitchen to make myself coffee, she makes another comment about your letter. She raises the same question you and Yasna both raised. You know, neither you nor Louisa have explained why you three were, were released 20 years ago after you spent only two days in jail. Saying that George Alberts arranged your release doesn't explain anything. Yaristan wants to know what power Alberts had to arrange your release. I'm curious about that, too. I can't answer Tina because I don't know. I vaguely remember that the police apologized to us. Perhaps they told us that our arrest had been a mistake, as they later told Yasna. I also vaguely remember that George Alberts wasn't arrested. But it was Louisa who said that Alberts made our release possible. I didn't think to ask her how he had done that. I simply passed her comment on to you. I'll try to remember to ask her. When I return to the living room, Sabina reminds me that you didn't answer the questions she had asked about Manuel. You commend her for guessing that Manuel and his friends were repressed by the revolutionary leaders and not by the reactionary generals, but you don't elaborate. She says the comment she made wasn't really a guess. She learned a great deal about that uprising from George Alberts. That's why she never accepted Luis's view of that struggle. Although Alberts didn't explicitly tell her that revolutionaries had been jailed and shot by the revolutionary government, she suspected this from what Alberts did tell her. Your accounts of Manuel confirmed her suspicions. She tells me that Alberts viewed that struggle as a struggle for industrialization and nothing more. In Alberts' view, everything else was romanticism or ideological obfuscation. That's also Sabina's view of that struggle. To her, 
I'm an example of the romanticism and Louisa of the obfuscation. Alberts told her that the sole task of that revolution was to sweep away the dark ages and create the conditions for progress. All those who opposed industrialization had to be pushed out of the way. These reactionaries included the church, the landowners, and the military. What always bothered Sabina was that Alberts also included reactionary saboteurs among the workers and peasants. Alberts, like Louisa, called these people lumpen and hoodlums. Sabina was always suspicious about the inclusion of saboteurs among the reactionaries for the very reasons you mentioned in your letter, but she had no way of knowing who they really were and what they were fighting for. She had thought they were revolutionary workers and peasants who had fought against both regimes because they wanted to industrialize on their own, without revolutionary leaders, without managers like George Alberts, without a revolutionary army. Manuel was apparently one of the people Alberts described as a saboteur and a lumpen. But what you've told me about him so far doesn't exactly fit the picture she's constructed of these revolutionary saboteurs. That's why she wants to know more about Manuel. Sabina also wants me to ask you and Yasna a question about Yasna's second arrest. Yasna says that the police insisted she had known a notorious foreign spy. They also asked her if she had known Luisa and me. Then Yasna comments mysteriously that they had the wrong last name down for Sophia and Luisa. Sabina asks if Yasna happens to remember the name the police had for us. Was that name, by any chance, Alberts? When Sabina raises this question, I ask her if she's suggesting that George Alberts was that foreign spy. I'm not suggesting anything, Sabina says. I'd just like to know if she remembers. We call Damon when supper is ready. Tina and I look at him quizzically. We can't wait to hear his response. It's the first time Damon has ever eaten at our house, and I can see that Sabina is waiting for the slightest pretext to tear into him. She dislikes academics in general. She dislikes Damon even more because he pretends not to be one. Damon starts eating and his sole comment is, Mmm, this is very good. What is it? I ask myself if he's going to avoid your letter. I've seen him do that before. Whenever he confronts a situation he doesn't want to face, he's like an ostrich with its head in the sand. He simply pretends the situation isn't there. The three of us eat in silence, glancing at Damon between bites. Finally, I can't stand waiting anymore and I blurt out, Did you read it? Every page, he says. Well, I ask, what did you think? I don't understand why you asked me to read it, Damon says. The entire exposition revives the worn-out theory of the backwardness of the working class. All three of us are startled. The what of the what, Tina asks, almost spitting out the mouthful of food she's just taken. Assuming his pedagogical posture again, Damon explains to Tina, the theory, or so-called theory, of the backwardness of the working class. It's nothing but a rationalization of the prejudices of petty bourgeois writers who don't know a thing about the revolutionary potential of the working class. Before Damon is done speaking, Sabina throws her knife down on her plate, gets up so abruptly she knocks a chair down behind her, and pointing her fork at Damon, she shouts, You're full of shit, Professor! Carrying the fork, she rushes away and slams the door of her room. Damon remains perfectly calm. She obviously agrees with him, he says, and continues eating. Tina, who remains as calm as Damon, asks him, How does that so-called theory apply to those sections of Yaristan's letter? Is anyone else going to wave a fork in my face? Damon asks, but neither of us laughs. If workers were as backwards as he d describes them, socialism would be impossible. Show me where he says workers are backward, Tina insists. How glad I am that Tina never attended school and therefore never learned to be intimidated by pedagogues who force one to assume what they then proceed to prove. Do you want me to quote the actual lines where he says it, Damon asked, trying to suggest that the passage I typed is full of such line. How else could you show me what he says, Tina asks. The idea of the worker's backwardness pervades his whole argument, Damon says curtly, as if with that statement he had definitively proved his accusation and he proceeds to shift the conversation to something else. The working class is inherently revolutionary. This is not a matter, hey, Tina interrupts, aren't you going to show me where he says the workers are backward? Damon is obviously not used to arguing with a person whose perception hasn't been dulled by formal education, and he proceeds as if he had succeeded in shifting the topic. The working class continually develops the capacity to create a new society, there as well as here. The workers always and everywhere exhaust the available possibilities. Tina just glares at him. Now wait a minute, Damon, I say, becoming as frustrated as Tina seems to be. Do you think the police regime Yaristan lived under for the past 20 years exhausted the available possibilities? I didn't say that, Damien insists. I said workers create organizations to struggle for whatever seems useful to them. These struggles win for the working class whatever it is objectively possible to win. 
These victories are never granted without struggle, and they are never tricks to deceive the working class. If you're not saying that police regime was a working class victory, then what in the world are you saying, Tina asks, apparently giving up her attempt to get her earlier question answered. What's wrong with your friend's comments, Damon says, is that he criticizes the role of all types of organizations and leaders in restraining and limiting the revolutionary capacity of workers. But he never deals with the question of organizations and leaders in a fundamental way. Unless you accept a conspiratorial theory of history, that organizations and leaders are always and everywhere introduced to restrain and defeat the workers. I'm lost, Tina says. At least I think I'm lost. Everything you say sounds like an evasion and seems to have nothing to do with what anyone is saying. I'm lost too, I admit. What's your point? That Yaristan doesn't deal with organizations and leaders in a fundamental way, whereas you do? That's right, he says. His critique of organizations and leaders is totally misplaced. Misplaced, I shout. He's been experiencing the effects of those organizations and their police for the past 20 years. He's not the only one experiencing those effects. So are millions of other people, he says. What in hell does that mean, I ask, starting to shake with frustration. There's no way to talk to him. I began to wish I had walked out like Sabina instead of trying to communicate with him. Your friend doesn't like real revolutions, Damon says. That comes through every line. He wants a revolution to be pure. But real revolutions are the only ones that take place, and the worker struggles are never pure. Your friend is against all real struggles. You're a real card, Professor, Tina says, and successfully pretending to be amused. Next time you come to dinner, I'm going to fry you a turd fish straight out of the toilet bowl, and if you don't like it, I'll ask, What's the matter with you, Professor? Do you only like food when it's pure? Damon turns to me, pretending that he's being persecuted, and asks, Do I have to listen to that? Without a trace of sympathy for his plight, I tell him, Damon, you don't have to listen to anything except your own inner voices. I'm trying to make the point, he continues, that your friend is like all those petty bourgeois writers who condemn real revolutions because they don't live up to certain standards set up, not by the struggling workers, but by the bourgeois writers. Workers always struggle for whatever is objectively possible, whether or not it's pure, whether or not it lives up to the standards set up by the bourgeois writers. I start to boil. That's an apology for police states if I ever heard one, I shout. Whatever happens to workers is for you a working class victory. If workers are shot and jailed, then that's the only victory that was objectively possible. Whatever happened to workers is all that was objectively possible. You're an apologist for the status quo. Yaristan is no more of a bourgeois writer than I am, Tina shouts. Damon at last shows signs of becoming angry. He turns to me and pretending to be injured at the very core of his being, he says, Sophie, your last statement is a complete distortion of everything I've ever said and you know it. You know perfectly well that I'm not talking about counter-revolutions, so don't you dare call me an apologist for counter-revolutions. I'm talking about revolutions that don't live up to the expectations of a middle-class intellectual. You don't know what you're talking about, Tina shouts. You, a full-fledged university professor, are calling someone who spent half his life working in factories a middle-class intellectual. Talk about distortions. How do you dare? That's just plain horseshit, Damon shouts cutting Tina short and losing his professorial detachment altogether. No factory worker I know could have written anything like this. Wow, shouts Tina. Look who's talking about the backward workers who can't write and have no standards. Do you want me to talk seriously or do you want to have a shouting match, he shouts. If you'd like to have a shouting match, then count me out because I've got more important things to do and my nerves can't take it. So what if he spent half his life in a factory? So have I. And you sure have capitalized on that fact, I comment sarcastically. What's that got to do with anything, he shouts. That doesn't make me a factory worker any more than it makes him a factory worker or anyone else in this room. It's obvious that he spent the other half of his life getting a political education every bit as complete as mine. Without the slightest hope of getting through to him, I comment, But Damon, this afternoon you said that one's relation to production is the only test of one's class. Tina says with venom, you're not the one to talk about other people's distortions, Professor. You're talking about someone who spent the other half of his life in prison. And if you call that a university education, you can kiss my ass and call it love at first sight, since it's obvious that with all your education, you didn't learn to call things by their names. Pretending not to have understood what Tina said, Damon turns to me and asks, Is this the level of your usual political discussions? No, it isn't, I say with venom that by this point matches Tina's. Neither Tina nor I have ever discussed anything at such a low level. I can see that it's time for me to leave, he says, getting up. You've evaded every one of Tina's questions with cheap tricks and sneaky shifts of topic. She asked you how you could call a worker who spent half his life in prison a middle-class intellectual. 
and not just any prison, but a prison created by the organizations and leaders you defend. Fidgeting with a doorknob, he says, I hate to say this, Sophie, but when it comes to politics, you're a complete ignoramus. If you know anything about the working class, you'd know that leaders don't simply impose themselves on the working class. Leaders are the products of the working class. If workers are defeated, it's not because of the evil ways of leaders, but because the working class isn't able to take control of the means of production. It's not their leaders, but their work itself that teaches workers how to run production. Shaking with frustration, I try to talk calmly. Damon, you just keep repeating that, but you obviously don't believe it. You learned your whole argument, not from work itself, but from the writings of a so-called revolutionary leaders. Half of your statements are quotations from the writings of the first dictator of the working class. Your naivete simply amazes me, Damon says, still fidgeting with the doorknob. It so happens that workers produce their strongest leaders when they're themselves strongest. The strength of the leaders derives from the strength of the working class. Now you've said it, I shout. The stronger the leader, the greater the triumph of the workers. You're an out-and-out -out apologist for the police state, and you camouflage it with such unbelievable claptrap about the workers themselves. For you, the total enslavement of the workers by the first so-called proletarian dictator is the model of the workers' victory. That's what you call the new society. The almighty leader is the sign of the strength of the workers. Slavery is freedom. Damon throws the door open but remains in the doorway. Your critique of the first great leader is misplaced, I cut in. All critiques of the great leader are misplaced because under all your talk about workers at the point of production, you worship the great leader. The sun rises and sets with the great leader. While I'm shouting at him, he walks halfway to his car, then turns around and shouts, that's right, misplaced. By raising the role of the great leaders in that way, you assume nothing has changed during the past 50 years. You're only demonstrating your complete ignorance of the fact that the working class today is even better educated and even better organized, not by political organizations, but by production. With modern technology and advanced means of communication, nothing can stop the workers from building a new society and a new state. A new state! You said it! An even newer state and an even more total dictator of the proletariat, I shout, while Damon rushes to his car. Tina runs behind Damon. It looks like she's going to rush into the car with him. He slams the car door. She plants herself by the driver's side of the car and starts shouting at him through the closed window. Now I understand what you're all about, Professor. You're a conservative bureaucrat who thinks workers are all popcorn eaters and baseball fans who don't know they're being had when someone calls himself their leader. To you, all those popcorn eaters are impure, and that's why they'll always be tied to the point of production. And that's why there'll always be room for flunkies like you in government palaces. Damon drives off. Tina, standing in the middle of the street, continues shouting at the quickly vanishing car. And anyone who tells you they're not going to remain at the point of production, that they're going to come out in mass to destroy the government palaces, is a misplaced petty bourgeois intellectual and an ignoramus who doesn't know that workers are impure. And you're betting they'll remain impure. They're sure as hell better remain impure if you're going to keep your cushy job. I burst out laughing. Tina looks so ludicrous standing in the street shouting at nobody. When she sees me, she starts laughing too, and when we go in, she comments, some fancy friends you've got. Yes, I certainly do have fancy friends. You and Yasna made that perfectly clear to me. I obviously couldn't have known it before your letter came, but now I see that Damon is in suitable company with Mark Glavney, Vera Nice Crena, and Adrian Povershan. Your letter was the instrument that unmasked this academic with a corpse in his mouth. This phony factory worker who parades as an expert on factory workers perfectly fits the picture you drew of him before you knew anything about him. He really is everything you say. The rigid theory he's been carrying around all these years transforms revolution into something like his own private domain. He's a priest of a sect of believers. That organization he's trying to found will only spread his own rigor mortis to others, and the aim of that newspaper he's talking about is to plant corpses in lots of people's mouths. Thanks to your letter, I can see through Damon, and I obviously understand that Adrian, Vera, and the others are opportunists, but I think your comments about me are extremely unfair. I once engaged in projects with those people, and those projects were very important to me. Does that make me one of them? Does that mean I was an opportunist too? I once shared a project with Damon. Does that mean I'm like him? I think it's mean of you to identify me with them. What I did and who I was can't be defined by what Damon became, nor by what Mark and Vera became. Even if Yasna is right, even if Mark, Vera, and Claude were already starting to climb bureaucratic ladders at the time I knew them, this doesn't mean that I was climbing such a ladder too. Damon was already a priest of a sect when I first met him and worked with him, 
But that doesn't mean I was a priestess of a sect, nor does it mean that the activity we shared consisted of propagating a religion. The activity I was engaged in, however flawed it might have been, was some kind of affirmation of life, not any kind of affirmation of death. If Vera, Mark, and Damon were running alongside me, but heading elsewhere, you can't say that I was heading towards a destination they reached. What they've all become doesn't tell you anything at all about who I am, nor even about what I did with them. Yes, like Damon, and like Mark, Vera, and Adrian, I went to the university. I do have that much in common with them, but not much more. Yasna went to college too, and she's neither an official nor a missionary. And if you call the carton plant our first university, then you too have that much in common with the rest of us. My similarity with Vera and Damon ends where it begins. My life in the university has nothing at all in common with Vera's or Adrian's or Mark's bureaucratic ambitions, just as my activity on the university newspaper staff had nothing in common with Damon's missionary activity. When I first met Damon on the newspaper staff, his relation to Minnie Vac was very similar to Adrian's relation to Vera. Damon and Minnie were members of a political sect like the one Damon is trying to bring to life again now. Minnie was always the theorist, and Damon was something like her henchman. Their organization published a paper, but I never read it, and consequently I can't tell you how well the self-chosen prophets recognized and recorded the new society while workers remained at the point of production. What I can tell you is that I did not work and would never have worked on their organization's newspaper, and that Damon and Minnie did not transform the university newspaper into their organization's organ. In this respect, Damon and Minnie were much more decent than their political enemies on the staff, Lamisel and Rhea Morphin. Lem and Rhea would have liked nothing better than to transform the university newspaper into a propaganda sheet for their organization, and I was as hostile to their attempts to do this as anyone else on the staff. You're probably right in saying that I recognize the repressive aspirations of Lem and Rhea mainly because they express them so openly, but you're wrong when you say I glorify their more sophisticated political cousins. If I glorified Minnie and Damon in my last letter, it was because the moments I shared with them on the newspaper staff were among the happiest moments of my life not because I shared any of their organizational commitments. I really do think you get carried away by your own rhetoric. In my last letter, I told you that my friend Alec had to trample publicly on all his past political commitments before Minnie and Damon accepted him as a friend and ally. Admittedly, I didn't make an exhaustive critique of Minnie and Damon, but the little I did say hardly amounted to a glorification, and I certainly didn't glorify anyone else on the staff. I rather think I made the others seem more ridiculous than they really were. I'll stop trying to compare my activity to yours. I realize that the circumstances are too different, and I'm obviously failing to communicate the similarities I see between the two situations. I finally understand your critique, and I recognize some of the people I worked with as targets of that critique. But I don't think the activity itself was determined by what those people were, nor by what they've become since. I think that my activity in the university was a modest but genuine act of rebellion against a repressive social system. I see that Damon fits your description of a repressive revolutionary, but I don't think the activity I shared with him can be described as repressive rebellion. The activity I'm about to describe began 14 years ago. We were among the first students who raised our voices against the witch hunts taking place at the time. Our activity didn't stop the witch hunts, and it obviously didn't destroy the social system that perpetuated them. But by raising our voices, we did stimulate others to raise theirs, and this is why I'm proud of having been part of that activity. Students at another university followed our example, and in time moved much further than we ever had dreamed of moving. In time, the protest movement grew so vast that it did play a role in putting an end to witch hunts, while it simultaneously re reproduced relationships which were at least repressive as the ones we had started to fight against. Our initial gestures weren't as far-reaching as those of the movement which later grew to such proportions, but the repressive overtones of our activity weren't as far-reaching either. Not that ugly relationships were absent among us. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case at all. A great deal was ugly. But there was one trait we didn't share with the later student movement, or at least with its spokesmen. In the activities I shared with them, these individuals didn't consider themselves spokesmen or representatives, despite the fact that almost half of the people on its staff were members of political organizations, which did claim to represent the interests of other people. Whatever they might have done in their organizations, when I worked with them, they didn't act as if history had elected them to reflect, represent, recognize, or record the desires of workers, students, or anyone else. Each one of us fought to realize her or his own desires. We represented no one but ourselves. No, we didn't even represent ourselves. We were ourselves. 
In my last letter, I told you something about the articles we wrote, articles which exposed the militarization of professors and students and documented the repression of radicals. I also mentioned the biggest article of the year, Minnie's interview with a campus general who kept files on all the students in the university. Minnie's article caused a scandal on campus. Alec and I were night editors on the issue in which Minnie's article was published. We worked on it on the very night when Sabina came to the co-op to tell me Ron had been killed. The following morning, Minnie, Damon, Alec, and I went to four of the boxes from which students took the paper. We engaged students in conversations about the article and asked their permission to publish their comments in the paper. We then ran a series of interviews with students in several consecutive issues. Some of the students' comments were priceless, especially those which expressed sympathy for the campus military establishment. I still remember the gist of what a bristle-haired athlete told me. He said he wasn't at all surprised that the Army and the police, Minnie's article hadn't said anything about the police, kept files on the entire population. After all, he explained to me, it's their job to protect society from dangerous elements, and the only way they can do their job properly is by constant surveillance of all actual and potential dangerous elements. They ought to use those files they've got and start rounding up all subversive, homosexuals, pacifists, and other crackpots so as to make life safe for the rest of the population. He ventured to guess that the reason the government isn't rounding up all those sick perverts is because the cost of imprisoning or exterminating them would be too great for the government's present budget. He concluded by saying that I, for one, would be glad to pay more taxes so as to enable the government to carry out that enterprise. I got several other interviews similar in outlook to this one, but none of them were as rabid. Minnie's interviews were precisely the opposite from mine. She said she couldn't stomach students who sympathize with the military, and she only interviewed those students whose comments were hostile to the general's files. One student she interviewed said he wouldn't be able to sleep anymore because every time he heard the police siren at night, he'd think the police were coming to arrest him. Others she interviewed spoke at length about the unconstitutionality of the general's files, and one student commented on the general's anti-Semitism. One of the insights that the general had gotten from his files was that subversive traits appeared more frequently among Baltic Jews than among any other easily identifiable group. I felt that my articles were much better than Minnie's precisely because I didn't just interview students who said things I agreed with. I felt that the students who defended the general exposed him much more effectively than those who attacked him. Besides which, it was such a ball to interview those reactionaries. I did them a favor of making their statements coherent and grammatical. Most of those protectors of civilization and culture, future officials and managers, hadn't ever learned to use their own language. Damon and Alec were terribly disappointing. They didn't contribute a single article. Instead of interviewing students, they had gotten into heated arguments with them, and Alec even got injured in a fight with a student he was supposedly interviewing. Every single one of Minnie's and my articles were published. It was obvious to Hugh, the editor, that my articles reflected one side of the picture, whereas Minnie's reflected the other side, and consequently there was never any question of excluding any article. This series of interviews caused as much of a scandal as Minnie's original interview, and the scandal led directly to the repression of the newspaper staff. Professors and students discussed these articles in their classes, and the city newspaper started to take an interest in the question, but the two city papers were owned by people just like the general who kept files, and they weren't interested in our exposures of the general's files, but in us. They started publishing stories which said the university newspaper had been taken over by a clique of reds and pinkos, and that this clique was intent on defaming and destroying the university, the army, and the flag. They quoted some of the most extreme statements of students we had interviewed, and said the statements had been parts of editorials which expressed the newspaper staff's policy. I've never known if it was the campaign carried on in the city newspapers, or pressure from the campus military, or the university's administration's own embarrassment that set off the repression. It was probably all of these things, plus some others I'm not even aware of. Only a few days after Minnie's original article appeared, we got a note from the administration demanding that the editor and managing editor go to the office of the university president immediately before the preparation of another day's issue. Hugh and Bess rushed to the president's office, and the rest of us continued working on the next day's paper. When Hugh and Bess returned an hour later, all the work stopped. Bess said the president had told them that the paper would have to stop publishing articles about the general's files. If such articles continued appearing, there would be severe consequences. Hugh said he had objected to being called to the president's office on a matter that is completely within the competence of the elected editor, and that he would disregard the president's threat and continue to edit the paper according to strictly journalistic standards.
Every one of us jumped up with relief and congratulated him for his principled stand, but he still wanted a vote of confidence. Since I was elected by the staff, the final decision has to be made by the staff. I feel that these articles are of high quality and of great public interest and that each article expresses a different side of the problem. Therefore, the question is whether or not the staff wants to continue to do what is perfectly justifiable from a journalistic standpoint, but may lead us to severe consequences, the nature of which is unknown to us. None of us could imagine what the severe consequences might be, and no one was particularly worried. Minnie and I still had several more interviews to publish, and the vast majority of the staff voted in favor of publishing them. Lem and Rhea abstained from voting. After all our articles were published, we all thought the crisis had blown over although the city papers continued carrying completely made-up accounts of who we were and what we did. About two weeks after my last article appeared, two weeks during which there hadn't been anything really interesting in the paper, the university administration struck. Something called a directive was released by the administration to the city press and the student government. We all gathered in the office and read the statement with disbelief. Minnie started crying. I felt like crying, too. Hugh seemed thunderstruck and just paced back and forth. According to this directive, the student newspaper would be given back to the student community at the end of that week. Since the directive came out on a Thursday, this meant we would only put out one more issue. The directive went on to say that after a brief delay, competent journalists selected from among the student body will resume publication of a newspaper that reflects the interests of the student community. This sentence suggested that we were neither competent nor students, but it also suggested something much more ominous. As far as any of us knew, the editors of the university's newspaper had always been elected by the staff, and this was now going to end. The selected journalists would obviously be people appointed by the administration. The statement also gave away what kind of people were going to edit a paper that reflects the interests of the student community. Obviously not people like Lem and Rhea, who in their own eyes reflected the interests of the student community, but rather people who reflect the students in the administration's eyes, namely people who serve the administration's interests, stooges appointed by the administration. The directive went on to explain the reasons for this action. It said that a self-perpetuating clique of radical agitators has taken over the publication of the student newspaper, thereby endangering the education and well-being of the student body and doing irreparable damage to the university's public image. This statement was not an outright lie. It was authority's way of stating the truth. Self-perpetuating simply meant that we elected our own editors, as opposed to the new arrangement, which introduced an administration-perpetuated clique. But the expression self-perpetuating clique made the electoral arrangement sound so underhanded and manipulative. It was also true that there were proportionately many more radicals on the newspaper staff than there were in the student body as a whole. For all I know, every radical in the university at that time was on the newspaper staff. But it's perfectly obvious why this should have been the case. It was a period when all self-expression was being fiercely repressed. Those few students who refused to be muzzled were by definition radicals since they were swimming against the stream. These were the only students who tried to express themselves at a time when self-expression was taboo. And where should they have gotten if not to the newspaper staff, the only place in the university where self-expression was still possible? The directive also said that the present staff of the paper was not being fired. On the contrary, the staff was being urged to cooperate with the new editorial board to make the paper a representative student newspaper, which is a positive asset to the university community. All of us skipped our classes and spent the day in the office planning our last issue. I felt as if a major historical event had taken place, as if a world war had just been declared. Hugh suggested that each of us write an editorial expressing our side of the question. He said the bias of the last issue would be more than compensated for by the fact that all the issues from then on would express the other side. I suggested that black borders be placed around every page, expressing the fact that the press had just died at the university. Bess Lack was violently opposed to this. Just because we won't be the editors doesn't mean there won't be a paper, she said. Someone called for a vote and everyone but Bess was in favor of the black borders. Rhea suggested that we use the front page to call for a mass demonstration against the suppression of the paper. Bess objected, You can't use the school paper to advocate a demonstration? And Hugh agreed. I tried to argue that we were no longer bound by regulations that the university itself had just broken, but only Lem and Rhea agreed with me. Suddenly, Thurston Rakshas, of all people, made a suggestion that seemed to be similar to Rhea's, although Rhea didn't think so. Thurston argued that it was perfectly legitimate 
to announce a coming event, since this was one of the paper's functions. We could announce that on Friday morning, the former staff members of the university newspaper were going to march in a funeral procession across campus, carrying the corpse of the university newspaper inside a coffin. That upper-class dandy always did have a sense of humor. I was immediately fired up by the idea. Hugh and Alec were also enthusiastic about it from the start. Minnie favored some kind of demonstration, but she argued that a funeral would only suggest that we had been defeated and had given up the struggle. For once, Lem and Rhea agreed with Minnie. Damon obviously did, too. The argument about the nature of the demonstration was sidetracked by Bess, who had worked herself up into a hysterical state. We can only express our opinions of the university directive. We can't use this paper to advocate one or another course of action. That's a betrayal of our trust. It's a crime. By calling for such a demonstration, we'd be using the paper as our own private organ. But the paper doesn't belong to us. It belongs to all the students. And it won't be dead just because some of us no longer work on it. Thurston defended his idea of announcing the mock funeral by pointing out that by the time it took place, the people taking part in it would no longer be the paper staff, but merely a group of anonymous students. Bess shouted at Thurston, But we're not anonymous students today. We're the editorial board and staff of the university newspaper, and today you can't transform this paper into an instrument for your own demonstration. Tomorrow you can carry all the coffins you want. Thurston angrily called for a vote. Bess shouted, It's not in our jurisdiction to vote about university regulations. Isn't it? Thurston asked. Watch this. All in favor of Bess's position. No one voted in favor. Not even Bess, since she disapproved of the vote. All in favor of mine. Everyone's hand went up except Bess's. But that was a sneaky maneuver. Thurston hadn't only put an end to Bess's objection. He had also closed the discussion on the nature of the demonstration. We were all aware of this, but no one reopened that discussion. I suppose we all knew that if we spent the day arguing, we wouldn't have time to prepare any kind of demonstration, to write our editorials, or to put out our last paper. And I suppose Minnie and Rhea considered Thurston's suggestion better than no demonstration at all. Bess stormed out of the office while Thurston's hastily called vote was taking place. She returned later in the day, but only to submit her editorial. She didn't take part in the work on the last issue. Later in the day, Rhea suggested that we run off leaflets announcing the demonstration and that we distribute them to all the student dormitories. I was in favor of doing that. Hugh objected to this type of agitation because the very nature of the demonstration required us to be dignified and responsible. Minnie said we simply didn't have time to do that, and she was right. We worked feverishly. Since everyone was composing an editorial, no one started doing the typing and editing until evening. Hugh did the layout in Bess's absence, and although he was as good at it as she, he wasn't nearly as fast. Late that night, Rhea made another suggestion. She said the former staff should start publishing an off-campus paper as soon as possible. Only such an act would clarify the real significance of the black borders and the funeral procession. The official university newspaper would have died, but not the people who had given it life. The contrast between the two publications would make it obvious to all that the press was still alive in our publication, whereas the university paper had become a corpse. I was moved by Rhea's suggestion, but no one discussed it. We were simply too busy. We didn't get the paper to the printers until 2 in the morning. We didn't leave the printers until 5, and we had to get up again a few hours later to carry out the demonstration we were announcing. Fortunately, when Thurston had made a suggestion, he hadn't expected the rest of us to do the work of implementing it. Thurston himself worked out the details of his mock funeral after he left the printer at five in the morning. One of his father's friends ran a funeral parlor. Thurston went there at six in the morning and explained to the undertaker that he needed a coffin as well as several wreaths and bouquets of flowers for a theatrical performance. He drove all the props to the campus in a hearse. All of us except Bess gathered at the newspaper office at eight in the morning, but the copies of the paper hadn't been delivered to their boxes yet because of how late we'd gotten the layout to the printer. The papers didn't arrive until nine, and we spent the hour frustratingly waiting for them, since our funeral would have been incomprehensible without any explanations. Rhea, naturally, reminded that leaflets would have solved this problem. We were all dead tired, but we started out full of enthusiasm. Thurston came dressed in a tuxedo, and Hugh wore a black suit and a comical black hat. Damon and Minnie walked in front of the procession, giving out copies of the newspaper. Hugh, Thurston, Alec, and Lem carried the coffin, which was covered with flowers. Rhea and I walked behind the coffin with wreaths. We walked, very slowly, in front of all the administrative and academic buildings and in front of all the dormitories. But our initial enthusiasm died. The mock funeral was a big disappointment, even to Thurston, 
Students would pause briefly, stare at the paper, stare at us, and then continue along their very paths. The main response was an icy indifference. Some students said things like, go back where you came from, and who do you think you're fooling? Not one student said anything sympathetic. I had hoped there'd be a mile-long procession, but not one student joined us. I don't think the fault lay with Thurston's idea. The eight of us would have looked even more ridiculous if we had announced a mass demonstration instead of the funeral. After walking for two hours, which seemed as long as two years, the procession returned to its starting point, and the coffin was taken into the editor's office. Lem and Alec came back out, but Hugh and Thurston stayed inside the editor's office and closed the door. I lay down on the bench. I was exhausted, and I felt like crying. Minnie asked if we had read the managing editor's final statement. I lazily picked up the paper and started leafing through it. I thought I had seen all the articles the night before, when I had edited the copy, but I remembered I hadn't seen Bess's editorial. You don't have to hunt for it, Sophie. It's right on the front page, Minnie told me. I sat up. I was furious. The headline in the middle of the front page said, Shades of Grey. The first line of Bess's editorial said, There is no black and white. There are only shades of grey. That didn't apply to the university's directive, which is what her article was about. Her next statement said, There are some arguments in favor of the staff's point of view, but there are also arguments in favor of the administration's point of view. The argument in favor of the staff was that the staff had consisted of relatively competent journalists, and that the coverage had, in general, been responsible and fair. But responsibility and fairness broke down when some staff members engaged themselves in an anti-military campaign. According to Bess, the editors, including the undersigned managing editor, convinced themselves that by printing articles favorable to the general and his files, alongside articles hostile to the general, the paper was expressing both sides of the question. But those were not really two sides of the question. According to Best, they were the same side, since the administration had made it clear that both types of articles created an image which damaged the university. Yet the editors and staff voted in favor of excluding the administration's side. I asked, who put this garbage on the front page? Alec answered, Hugh typed it, edited it, and laid it out in the middle of the front page so that the last issue wouldn't spoil the paper's tradition of fairness. But it's full of distortions and outright lies, I said. Hugh must have known we'd all want to leave it out, Alex said. That's why he didn't let us see it before putting it in the middle of the front page. I felt like vomiting. I had not only hoped that a mile-long procession would follow our coffin, I had also hoped that our course of action would somehow be very clear when the demonstration ended, that we would know what we had to do next. But nothing was clear except that my project was over. It had ended as abruptly as my activity at the carton plant had ended when we were arrested. And at that moment, I blamed Hugh for the failure of the demonstration. I convinced myself we would have had support, and lots of it, if Bess's ugly argument hadn't appeared in the middle of the front page. But instead of storming into Hugh's office, I lay back down and closed my eyes. My exhaustion was greater than my anger. I must have dozed because I wasn't aware until later that a strange sequence of events had begun to take place. 